God took six days and created earth and moon, the stars and sun. On the seventh day, He rested from the work that He had done. Then He blessed it, made it holy as a gift for every Just how this world began. Holy day, purified, set apart, sanctified, enter into joy divine in a temple made of time. See him worship. On the Sabbath, as his weekly custom was, feel the fury of the rabbis, for he would not heed their laws. So they killed him on a hillside as the sun began to fade, but he even kept the Sabbath. As they laid him in the grave. I recognize a friend of mine is preaching on the other side of town. I recognize a lot of people have went to go see my friend. A friend of mine, Randy Steve. And I pray that uh, the Lord will bless his work and his labors. Uh, he's, a good, he's, a, he's a powerful preacher and one that fears God and tells and teaches and tells it like it is. Right? So at this time though, before we get started, uh, my subject to you this evening is um, Isaiah 6 and Michael standing up. Isaiah 6 and the standing up of Michael. Alright, so we're going to look at these two issues and see how they come together. But before we do, I, I want to have a word of prayer because without Jesus, I can do nothing. John 15, 5, put it this way. I am the vine, ye are the branch. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. I realize without Jesus, I can do nothing. So I want to pray. I want you to pray with me. If we pray to claim the promise for the Holy Spirit. If there was ever a time when God's people need to be earnestly praying for the Holy Spirit and for early and latter rain, it is now. It is right now while you're watching your president of this country merge church and state together and put a West Wing in the White House for the Office of Religion, which is totally unconstitutional based on the Constitution of the United States. Brothers and sisters, you are watching the image of the beast being formed. You're only waiting for the churches to receive power. And pretty soon, that little docile office of religion will be more powerful than the political government of the United States. It happened during the time of Justinian, and it will happen again in our time. For history will be repeated, and we are emerging at this time. If there's a time, we need to be awake and get the message out and warn the people and communities and at the same time talk about Christ, redemption, salvation, prayer, putting away of sin, plus warning them about the mark of the beast, the image, and the plagues, and the things that are about to take place. It is now. You don't have a lot of time. For you and I are not tested on the mark. You and I are tested. The pressure that will come from the churches, from the political powers of earth, to give up the Sabbath and keep Sunday like the rest of everybody. This will come soon. It is coming sooner than most of us even imagine. Young people, I will tell you, if you need to come out of the world, it's tonight. If you've been in the world, been playing in church, 
have and have in have out. I'm going to tell you, for the, for the glory of God, but for the mercy of God, come out of the world now. Please. Your salvation is at stake. And you don't have a long time. He that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Amen. Please keep it in mind. Amen. With that thought in mind, I'm going to claim the promise in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10, and we're to pray. For what we're going to talk about tonight. The Bible says, but as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit search of all things, yea, the deep things of God. That word deep things is the Greek word bathos. It means to go beneath the surface. Meaning there's truths found in the word of God that lies beneath the surface of the very text you read. That will give you insight into the end times that you're now living in. Take you deeper in the meaning and for you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We are on the verge of a crisis in this nation, in this world. Even in our churches. Yeah. And we must know how to contend for our faith. And make a stand for right. Though the heavens fall. Yeah, for the greatest one in this world. Is the one of men. Men who will not be part of soul. Men who will be true to duty. As a needle to a pole. Men who do not fear to call sin. By its right name. Amen. These are the men. That God is going to raise up. To yeah. give the final call. And the last message to our perishing world, and even to many of our own church members who are perishing in their pews while playing with the world. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it is now his time. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are bowed before thee because we realize without thee we can do nothing. We need the presence of your Holy Spirit you said, if you then be an evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? You said in Acts chapter 5, verse 32, and we are his witness of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. Lord, we ask thee, grant us that Holy Spirit. And grant that he might guide us into all truth. And he will show us things to come, and he'll help us get ready. Get ready, get ready for the coming of our Lord. For he, for Lord, your coming is closer than we can imagine. And yet, coming to our name in judgment is even closer. Please, Father, please have mercy. And please help us, we pray, in Jesus' name and for his sake. To the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary do we direct our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 12, verse Isaiah, verse 6, verse. Let's go to that verse. Isaiah 6, we look at it, verses 1 through 8. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. When you get there, just say amen. Are you there? The Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the doors moved at the voice of him that cried. And his house, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sins purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I sin? And who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Now Isaiah, according to this issue, Isaiah for a long time had been following the dictates and 
following the idea that he was the nephew of King Uzziah. And as a result of being family related, you know how it go. You're somebody, you know, you have your own, you know. Your 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 uncle is the king of uh of uh, 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 of Israel. And Isaiah went around pronouncing woes on everybody else. Sometimes we can be in the church for many years and don't know the God that we serve. Hmm. Even though we served in church capacity hmm. as elders, pastors, deacons, hmm. and don't know the God that we serve. Have good relations with one another, good fellowship. Uh, rub shoulders with some of the big shots hmm. in the church. Hmm. But don't know the God that called us. Isaiah, one day, after his uncle had died, walked into the temple of the living God. He said his train filled the temple. Isaiah and Vision said, Above him stood the seraphs. Each one has six wings. And he said, if they were so reverent, Isaiah said, but twain, he covered his face. But twain, he covered his feet. And but twain, with his wings, he did fly. Isaiah is describing the reverence and holiness of God. And even the angels built their faces in his presence. And all he heard the angels saying was what? Holy, holy, holy. Now, why was the angel saying, holy, holy, holy? What was it that was causing the angel to repeat? You and I would say that maybe it would become a little redundant to keep saying, holy, holy, holy. Well, if you didn't have any other thing to say, and all you could say was, holy, 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 and perhaps to you it would be redundant. But these two, these cherubim angels stood in the light of God. You must remember something about the light of God. You see, 1 John 1, 5 put it this way. This is the message we have heard of him. I'm declaring to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now, you must also remember that God is light, but light is not just a light shining on you. Light gives information. So, when Psalms 119, 130 says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. It is talking about the fact that when you come into the presence of God, God's light, when it begins to shine on you and shine on your mind, it constantly illuminates. But this, with this illumination comes understanding. Understanding about the power, the greatness, the mercy of God. The power, the greatness, the mercy, the, the, the omnipotence of God. The holiness of God. And all you can say is you become so overwhelmed by the glory and the understanding of that power. All you can say is holy, 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 holy. Because your mind is constantly getting a revelation of the power, the might, and the mercy of God. And his mind is inexhaustible. And that light is shining upon your mind. This is what happens when the angels are in God's presence. And you must understand that God, the Father, is there, but also the Word is there. Y'all forgot about it. Remember, wait a minute. Don't you remember what Jesus told Moses? What did God tell Moses? I'll meet you. You'll meet with me. Between the two cherubims. Now, in the Hebrew sanctuary, the two cherubims sat there, and the Word was the major focus. In some uh, sanctuary, they call it the ask. But in the midst, between the two cherubims stood the ask, which represented the word of God, the word of the living God, so powerful and so holy that when they spoke those terms, when they mentioned his name, they had to mention it with reverence. And when they, when, they, when, they, when they began to read, they had to read it with reverence, and they had to be sure not to, not, not to misread anything. The word was so sacred, but yet so holy. But that word that was in between the two characters did not stay there. 
One day the Bible says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now this Word that was with God the Father was the Word that sat between the two cherubims. This Word was the one that sat in the most holy place. Are you with me now? And he said, and this Word was God's thoughts made. This Word that was God's thoughts would now become audible for man to see. And when we read John, we read, and the word was made flesh. And the word, what word? The word that sat between the two cherubims. The word that was in the axe. Let me go one more step with you. The Bible called it the, the, the Shekinah glory. The glory that would be greater than the temple that Solomon built. You see, today people say Solomon built the temple. Solomon never had a temple. The temple that Solomon made was God's temple. Amen. But the day that Solomon practiced idolatry, the day that Solomon went after the other gods, God said, I'm jealous for my name. And if the day you disobey me, the day you turn your back on me, I'll take my name out of that temple. And today, people call it Solomon's temple. But it was never Solomon's temple. It was a temple that David had built and said he could make. He wanted to build it himself, but God said, David, you can't build it because you have blood on your hands. You have innocent blood on your hands. Your son Solomon will build my temple. But then Solomon went astray and brought in the different gods into the temple. And he listened to his wives and he married. And that's why it's only good to have one. Amen. Amen. But anyway, so because of this, God took his name out the temple. Because yes. his name stood for his character. God's character does not mix with other gods. So it went down in history as Solomon's temple. Because of the idolatrous heathen practices Solomon had introduced later. But I thank God for one thing. That was the earthly sanctuary. The Bible tells me over in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Now, the things we have spoken, this is the song. We have such a high priest. Now, let's stop for a moment. We're going to break down the scriptures now. If you don't mind, I'll take the jacket off a little bit. It's time to get into the Word of God. You ready? Yeah, I already got, I'm watching my time here, but I'm not going to keep you long because then you won't come back tomorrow. So, uh, let me help you out right now. You ready? You sure? Yeah. You, 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 all right, you got your pen, your pen and paper, ready? All right, let's, let's, let's study the word. You ready now? Let's compare. Hebrews 8, 1 now. Let's go there. The Bible said, Now the things we have spoken, this is the song. We have such a high priest. Now, before I go any further, who is this high priest? Go with me in your Bible. I want the Bible to answer. I know you might have the answer, but I want to prove it from the scriptures. Are you with me now? Go with me to Hebrews 4, 14. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. If you get there, just say amen. Are you there? We're going to come back now. You ready? Hebrews 4.14. The Bible says here. The Bible says here. Seeing then we have a great what everybody? A great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus the son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Let's stop right there. Who's the high priest? Jesus the what? The son of God. Now let's go back to Hebrews 8.1. Let's put it together. Now the things we have spoken. This is the song. We have such a what? High priest. Now stop. Such a who? Such a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, who is sat on the right hand of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. But now notice, he's a minister of everybody of the temple. Another for temple is sanctuary, which what? The Lord pitched and not man. So this is a sanctuary of God. This is the pattern that Moses saw in the mount that he made a copy of in the Old Testament. So therefore, we're talking about Jesus is the high priest of a heavenly, a heavenly sanctuary. Are you with me now? So let's go a bit closer. The Bible said, who sat down on the right hand of the majesty. Now, I want you to notice something in Hebrews chapter 8. The Bible says here, it says here, he says who sat. Now, I didn't, I didn't say sat. It didn't say sat down. It said who is set on the right hand. This word set means to be in position. Now, but where is he sitting? 
on the right hand. What does right hand represent? In the Bible. You say right hand represents power. But let's go to the Bible. Let's see what the Bible tells about right hand. Go with me in your Bible for a moment to Isaiah chapter 41. And let's look at verse 10 together. Isaiah 41.10. The Bible says in Isaiah 41.10, it says, Fear thou not, I am with thee. And be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So the right hand is a symbol of what? Righteousness. So Jesus is set in position on the right hand of the majesty in heaven to minister his righteousness to his people. Imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness. That's why the message to God's people, while Christ is your high priest, is that I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. You don't believe it? Christ is your high priest. Christ is at the right hand to minister his righteousness. You see, the priest, what did the Bible say about a priest? I want to know. Go me to Revelation chapter 1 for a moment. Go to Revelation chapter 1. Won't you get this with me for a moment? Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, let's look at verses uh, 12 through uh, 16 for a moment. Revelation 1, 12 through 16. And I'll turn there so it won't book text so bad, but you got to get there. Are you there now? Revelation 1, 12 through 16. The Bible said, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, and girded up with caps and a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes was a flame of fire, and his feet were as fine brass and burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining up in his strength. Wait a minute, whose countenance was as the sun shining in his strength? One like the Son of Man. What did he He was clothed with a garment down to his foot. You know what type of garment that was? That was a linen garment. The linen garment is a garment of a priest. Jesus is revealing himself in Revelation among the seven golden candlesticks as the priest of all, all the churches because at that time he's in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Are you with me now? That's what he's revealing in. Now notice something else about him. What did the Bible say about a priest? I said he's ministering what to us? Righteousness. You heard me say that early on. Go in your Bibles for a moment to Psalms 132. Psalms 132, and I'll turn there. Are you there? Not there yet. Come on. Get there. You got 30 seconds to find your Bible text. You do. If you were in the street and you had to do it, and you had to contend for your faith, you got 30 seconds. If you can't find your text in 30 seconds, you might as well just say, Brother, I'll talk to you later. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Psalms, one, Psalms one, 132. Look at verse 16 with me for a moment. I want to talk about how the priest. The Bible said, the Bible said he was in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He was clothed with a garment down to his foot. What did it mean for that priest to be clothed? Look what the Bible says here in Psalm 132, 16. The Bible said, I will also clothe her priest with what? Salvation. So wait a minute. When you're looking at Jesus standing in the midst of the seven candlesticks, clothed with a garment down to his foot, a linen garment of that represented a priest, what is he clothed with? Salvation. By the fact, Matthew 1 21, and she shall pray forth for a son, and shall call his name what? Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Then mean, what is salvation? Deliverance from sin. That means victory over sin. Amen. And you're not going to be saved in transgression. Amen. Anybody tell you that is a lie? Sure. Sure. He that saith, I know him, and keep him not his commandments, is a liar, yeah. and the truth is not in him. Yeah. The only person who the written in their lives was the devil. Isn't that right? John 8, 44, you are your father the devil. And the lust of your father is what you He was a murderer from the beginning and a boy not the truth. And when he speaks of a lie, he speaks of his own. He is a liar and the father of it. Isn't that what the Bible says? And what does the Bible say about those who don't want to hear God's law? What did it say about those who, who want to continually go on and believe they're going to be saved without walking in God's commandments? The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 9, he that turn away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. God doesn't even endorse the prayer. Psalm 6, 6, 18 says what? If I regard an equity in my heart, the Lord would not hear my prayer. So if God not hearing your prayer, you're breaking the commandments. 
dead. Who was he in your prayer? The devil and his angels. Because he broke the commandments and he knows that if you break the commandments, you're going to join him in the lake of fire one of these days. Won't you get the point with me? Let's see what the Bible says. But let's look a bit closer now. So we're going to find something else here. So he clothed with a garment down to the priest who clothed what? Salvation. We know how the priest clothed with. Go me to Psalms 132. And let's look here at verse Ox. Let's look here at verse uh, 9. He said, let thy priest be clothed with what now? Righteousness. Let the priest be clothed with what? Righteousness. What is righteousness now? What is righteousness? Go me to Psalms 119, 172. Psalms 119. 172. Psalms 119, 172, the Bible says, My tongue shall speak of thy word. For all, how many? All, all how many? All, all how many? All. all. I keep asking that for a reason now because we get, we get to the point we don't know who we are anymore. Hmm. We start to forget about we, that, we, that the Sabbath is actually God's day of rest. We think, some people say, What difference does a day make, make? It makes a righteous, holy difference. You hear what I said? What difference does it make? It makes a righteous, holy difference. What do you mean, righteous, holy difference? Let me break it down to you. Psalm 119, 172 said what? My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are what? Righteousness. Now, what's the end fruit of righteousness? Holiness. And without holiness, no man can see God. You don't believe you're going to... How are you getting into the heaven? How are you going to heaven? Going heaven to heaven, going to heaven on the merits of Jesus. If it can be, if it can be determined by the power of the Holy Ghost that the work that you did, you recognize it was not you. That did. You took no credit, you took no glory to yourself, but you realize that it was God working in you both to will and to do according to His good pleasure. And you gotta keep you better keep that in your mind. Because if you stand up before God and say, Lord, look what I've done. I prophesied in your name. I kept. You did? You did part from me. I never knew you. Ye that work iniquity. Are you with me now? That's what you see. It's not what you do. It's what Christ has done in you because you died that Christ might live. When did you die? You're supposed to have been dead in baptism. Some of you came back to life. Been alive ever since. And that's why there's no work being done in the church. Because you're around. As long as you're, long as you're around, the work can't get finished. Because you are standing in the way of the work of God in you. You have become your own stumbling block. You got that right? And so the work of God that should be done in evangelism is not being done because you worry about what people think about you. You want position and you want power. And you want to be the elder next year. You want to be hot not with the pastor. Why don't the pastor pick me? Why don't he just let me do it? I can, I can do better than so and so. What's the matter here? It's an eye problem. And it's not your four eyes or your two eyes. Is your inner eye, yourself. Like Paul says, in order to do the work of God, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that lives within me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Tell me, do you live that way? I'm not asking you about your job now. I'm asking you about the work of God. When are you going to finish it? You're satisfied being here another 40 years? Watching crime and violence everywhere. Homosexuality came out the closet now. Churches are embracing it. We all in the, we all we all sit in the limits here, even in our own churches now. Yes. And we're sitting here watching all these stuff. And we're watching Noah's Day and Sodom and Gomorrah. And now we're looking at the image of the beast, and you're still satisfied. Yes, Lord. How is that? That is phenomenal. That's amazing. That means you're so cold and so dead that you don't even keep up with the signs of times. Nor do they shake you or cause you to get on your knees and say, Lord, have mercy on me for my time that I have wasted. Have mercy on me, Lord, for letting myself get in the way. Have 
mercy on me, Lord, for being so sensitive that I became insensitive to others. Nor did I have a burden for the work of God. I just had a burden for a position in the church. Have mercy on me, Jesus. God help us. When you stand before God, position will mean nothing. The only thing God's going to ask you is, where is your fruit? Where are the souls that you post to Where are the people you post to visit? I gave you a prison ministry. Why didn't you do it? I told you 20 years ago, I waited on you, and you said, Lord, when I retire, you retired, and you still didn't do my work. Where are the souls that I tell you to gain? You, got, you started off reading your Bible, you started off, but you got sidetracked on another little issue, and you became fanatical and extreme to the point I could not use you anymore. And then you continue to condemn your brothers and sisters and you were being self-righteous all the time and you didn't look at yourself. What you going to say in that day when you're standing there without a wedding garment on? Standing in the very presence of God. No wedding garment. Naked. Not even right so Not even rags. Just naked. What are you going to say? You don't believe you're going to be naked? Think of Revelation chapter 3. Come on. I want to show you. Talk about Isaiah the temple. And Michael standing up. Come on. Revelation chapter 3. Look what the Bible says again. Revelation chapter 3. Look at it, verse uh, 18. Look what the Bible says in Revelation 3 18. I counsel thee. If I only go, try to what? Fire. That I might have a word, everybody. That I might what? That I might be rich. Are you with me now? That I might be rich and in, in white raiment. That thou mayest be clothed, and that the word of your body, that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear. The Bible said, many in our church are naked. They're standing in nudity before God. Spiritual nudity. Not a fig leaf, not even a rag. Just naked. Spiritually naked. Because they're loving this present world. They're loving to lie, loving to practice deception, loving to manipulate them, the, 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 to get their way. Naked! Oh, holy God. God, God. What he said, I come to the Bible, he go. Now, how you gonna buy? He said, buy. How do you buy? Come on, talk to me. Let's see, Isaiah 55, 1, I'll tell you how you're gonna buy. Look at Isaiah 55 1. So let's, see, let's, let's see what Isaiah 55 1 tells us about it. You ready? Come on, you ready? You over there yet? Yeah, you some more Isaiah 55. Come on. Let's go to verse 1. Come on, you there? Hold everyone that thirsty. Come ye to the waters. Ye that have no money, come by and eat. <coughs> now, wait a minute. Hold everyone that what? Thirst. Now, in other words, you won't buy unless you're thirsty. Now, when we're thirsty, we drink water. In fact, I'm going to have some right now. Well, I'm sitting here talking to you. Well, I'm drinking apple wine. Just drink that. Okay, okay, okay. All right. All right. So get that. All right. All right. All right. Just drink some water. You're you with me now, right? Yeah, when you're thirsty, you want to drink water. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the water. Stop right here. Ready? What, is, what, what does he mean? Everyone that thirsts, thirsts for what? Go be in Matthew chapter 5. Come on. Keep your finger at Isaiah. Come on. Keep your finger. I'm taking you through. Come on. Matthew 5. Look at verse 6. The Bible says, Blessed are they that do what? Hunger and thirst after righteousness. Wait a minute. What are you to be thirsty about? Righteousness. Whose righteousness should you be thirsting for? Christ's righteousness. Philippians 3 9 put it this way, being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness which is of God by what? Faith. So the Bible says that whole everyone that thirsteth, those who are thirsty will come to the waters. Wait, what's the waters? What's the water? Go read your Bibles. Come on. So you can look at me strange. Go ahead, John chapter 7, verse 37, 38. I want to see what water is. Come on. Because it come for those who thirst, right? John 7, 37 to 38. The Bible said the and 39. The Bible said the last day of the great feast. Jesus stood and cried, If any man thirst, 
What did Isaiah say? Oh, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters. What did Jesus say? If any man thirsts, what did he say? Look what he says. He says, if any man thirsts, what everybody? Let him come to me and drink. First of all, Jesus is water. <laughs> Look what it goes on and says. Now he's going to give you drink. He's going to give you some water. What type of water he's going to give you? It's holy water. And it's not Catholic. <laughs> Are you with me now? Look at the Bible goes on and says here. It says, he that believe for me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow what? Lit rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that have that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So wait a minute. What was your thirst for? Righteousness. But wait a minute. You said righteousness is the our most thirst for righteousness, but Jesus said, I want water, they gonna give me the Holy Ghost. What does the Holy Ghost got to do with righteousness? Go in your Bibles to Galatians. Come on. All right. Let me give it. Let me let me let me connect something. In fact, before I go there, before I go to Galatians, go be to Hosea 10, 12. Hosea 10, 12. We can connect. Ready? Hosea 10, 12. Are you there now? In Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, it says, "So to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up the fallow ground. The fallow ground means fallow ground. Your heart and reality." Bring up the fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he rain righteousness upon you. Now wait a minute. What's God going to rain on you? Righteousness. So righteousness is connected to rain? Y'all missing that on your people. Righteousness is connected to rain? Amen. Is that why it's rain? Huh, okay. Rain, righteousness upon you, okay? But then it said the Holy Ghost, right? So let's see something. Let's see something else right quick. Righteousness can't do rain, so how is the rain coming? Go a minute, Deuteronomy 32, 1 and 2. Come on. Deuteronomy 32, 1 and 2, right? Let's lock this one down. Give me your heavens and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew. Wait a minute. Goes on and says, and says, as the small rain upon the tender earth, and as the showers upon the grass. By the way, if you look at that word showers very carefully, it means prophecy. But God's going to drop two things doctrine and prophecy. And He said they come as rain. So you're praying for lack of rain? <coughs> Early rain? And you don't know what the rain is? You sitting here saying, Lord, give me rain, and then you get off your knees like. <laughs> Where is that? They told me we're gonna have a, 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 a lot of rain on, we're gonna pray for rain on all of a sudden we pray for rain and came out of church and I didn't feel no different. Because it wasn't based on feelings. Hmm. It was based on faith. And it was based on you understanding through faith what the rain was. It was for you to be understanding doctrine. You're not supposed to be in a state right now where you don't know what you believe. You're not supposed to be in a state right now where you're not, you don't know about, you don't understand the prophecies. You're not supposed to be in a state right now where you're confused about who the beast is. Duh. We're not supposed to be in this type of mindset because we pray and ask God for rain. But wait a minute. What does rain got to do with the Holy Ghost? Let me help you out. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Chapter 5, now come on. Galatians 5, are you there? Should be there by now. If you're not there by now, I'll wait longer. <laughs> longer I wait, longer you'll be here. If you say amen, I'll just keep waiting. Oh, I got some amen. It's all right, let's go. Go with me now in your Bible, so Galatians 5. Look here with me at verse 5. The Bible said, for we, through the what, everybody? Through the Spirit, wait for the hope of what? Righteousness by faith. Wait a minute. How is righteousness by faith coming? It's coming like rain. What form is it coming in? Not experience it. It's coming to you as doctrine. Well, what doctrine got to do with righteousness? Let me help you out. Go to 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16. 
Look what the Bible says. Come on, you there? Come on. You, you got to get there. Come on. Got to keep going. Are y'all ready? The Bible says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is possible for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in front of everybody. Righteousness. righteousness. Wait a minute. The scriptures give instruction in righteousness. So when that rain, when the Holy Ghost come upon you, what will you be led to do? You'll be led to study the Bible like you never studied before and get instruction in righteousness and you'll take God in his word and you'll put away sin. You'll start having revival and reformation. Because the Holy Ghost will give you a power now to obey. You don't believe me, do you? Go to Romans 6.16. Come on. Romans 6.16. I still, I, still I still see disbelief in the faith. <laughs> Where are you getting this from? Hmm? We're getting it from the scriptures, if you notice. <laughs> Look what the Bible says. Look what the Bible says. Are you there? Yes. The Bible says, Know ye not to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants are whom you obey, but the sinners and death are obedience unto what? Righteousness. How many? What? Obedience unto what? Righteousness. Wait a minute. What did the Bible just say? You yield or surrender your life to Christ. You give it with all your mind, all your heart, and all your soul. You can't give God your heart. Steps of Christ, chapter on consecration, says this. You cannot, we cannot give God our hearts. But we can surrender our will. And as we surrender our will on a daily basis, God begins to impart to us, impute and impart to us the Holy Ghost. And we start having power to obey. Anybody tell you it's impossible to keep God's law in line? Uh, the only thing is the only only person to only there's only one person that told it's impossible to keep God's law. If you have a carnal mind, it's impossible for you to keep God's law. If you're born again, you can keep God's commandments. Amen. But you gotta get yourself out of the way. Yeah. Not what you do, but what Christ does in you for the hope of glory. Are you with me now? Yeah. What you just say? But well, now wait a minute. So let's go back to what we're saying now. So wait a minute, all that commandments are what? Right. Righteousness. The scriptures give instruction in what? Right. Righteousness. And you accepted all that by what? Right. Hey, how does faith come? Right. Romans 10, 17. So then faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So what is the patience of the saints? Let's talk about that. Since we put my book to store that in there, might have thrown it in with it. Since we're looking at all this. What is the patience of the saints then? You remember Romans 14, 12? Here it says the other. And here is the what? And here are the patience of the saints. Here are they to keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Faith of Jesus? Now notice it said faith of Jesus. It say faith in Jesus. See, faith in Jesus means you believe. Faith of Jesus means you got the same faith Jesus got. Are you sure you got it? Are you sure you got it? You got to, listen, you got to, you got to explain. You got some components here. What is faith of what is faith of Jesus talking about? Same faith as Jesus. So wait a minute. How do you have the same faith as Jesus? Well, the only way you can figure it out is you've got to go back to the issue of faith. Romans 10, 17 says, So your faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Correct? Yeah. Hebrews 11, 1 says, now, now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. All right? Faith in the word of God, belief in the word of God, but belief with the mind to obey. That can only happen to a man that's born again. Mm. It is not forensic justification as Desmond Ford and others are. A legal declaring you righteous. No, it is you being righteous, declared righteous, but you have had experience of being born again. You have a new heart. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So therefore, now you have a new heart. Now you can have faith that takes God and his word. Faith that comes by hearing. Hearing means with the ear to obey. Now, what's going to happen to you now? Now the Bible says your faith is going to be tried. I'm talking about faith in Jesus now. Talk about Isaiah. Talk about Isaiah. And Michael stand up. He said, well, we want the Michael stand up. You're going to get there. If you don't get there now, I get there in the morning. Don't worry. I'm going to buy some time with you. Y'all come back here tomorrow. That's all. Look what the Bible says here. Why don't you get this with me now? Go be to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Share this with you. Why am I looking at it? You're there? Romans 8. Are you there? 
Now, what is faith? In Hebrews 11, 1, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, the substance for faith is the Word of God. It is the promise of God. Question, do you have faith? Do you believe in the promise of God under pressure? I ask, did you believe in the promise of God while you attend church? I ask, do you exercise belief in the promise of God when you're under pressure? I ask, do you, go, do you come to church and say, Pastor, pray for me that I, that I won't lose my job. Do you have faith in God that if you lost the job under pressure because you stood for God, he has already made a way for you to have enough even if it takes a little time, do you get up in the morning still and worship Him? Do you get up in the morning and not I'm saying, I ain't saying you come here and sing. I'm talking about do you sing in your home? Do you have your worship in the home? Do you have your Bible study in the home? Do you sit down and say, Lord, I believe you want to take care of me in my home. My bills are due. But Lord, all I, I know you already made a way. I'm talking about that type of faith. Why am I talking about that type of faith? Because the Bible said the faith of Jesus. Look here for a moment. Romans 8, 24, look what it says. For we are saved by hope. Okay. Now, where do you get your hope from? Because the hope is connected to the substance. Where do you get your hope from? Romans 15, 4 says, For what sort of things were written before time, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Where is your hope coming from? The scriptures. So why is it that you're up and down? Because every day that you don't read the scripture and you have pressure, you're down. And every day that you read the scriptures and have faith, you're up. And every day that you miss, you're always down. And they you know you're depressed in the church. You're depressed in the church in Jesus. How is that? I'll tell you how. Because you don't know Jesus. You don't spend time with Jesus. You just come to church. And then if the pastor feeds you or an elder feeds you, you're great. But if they don't feed you, you go home just as empty as when you left the house. And then you want to know if this is the right church after all. Then you want to know where it happened to my spirituality. Then you want to know why you fall into sin. Then you want to know, then you start questioning this, questioning that. And then you go, then you try to use your intellectualism, your education, and then try to use that for the cover up. And you know, I believe in the Lord. And you know the Lord. You know, I just think sometimes that we go too far with this. You, and you're talking all this foolishness because you don't know God. And you're not spending time with God. And you're sitting here wrangling and wasting our time. Amen. Thank you. Sitting you just humbling down realizing I don't know Jesus. And I'm not having a relationship with him. Brothers and sisters, pray for me. <laughs> That's what we're doing. So we're playing church. There's somebody in the church, and everybody, and there's somebody was, who's naive and don't know their Bible. Where I said, "Wow, that was really good." <laughs> and you look at like, "What did you say?" He didn't say anything. Well, see, you he ain't credible. Really, to the law, to the testimony. If he speak not according to his word, there is no light in him. Amen. I don't care how popular he is. Y'all don't get it. Y'all don't get it. Y'all 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 figure it out there. Look with me now. Come on. So Romans 15, 4, so four so things written four times written for our learning that we do patient covering scriptures might have what? Hope. But that hope, look what the Bible says. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? So wait a minute. Faith of Jesus is having faith in that which you cannot see. And yet, because you don't see it, because the word of God said it, you still hope for it. Are you with me now? Watch the closer, closer, closer. It says, but if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Now this is a hard part. Paul said, if you hope for that which you see not, with patience you what? You wait for it. What's coming? Wait a second. Why did you say patience? Wait for it. Turn to Romans 5, 3. You're going to see why right now. Talk about the peace of the saints. Romans 5, 3 said what? The Bible says, are you here? Know ye not? That is, okay, Romans 5, 3, I'm trying to read one. It says, and not only so, but we glory in what? 
We glory in what? We glory in what? Now see, this is what y'all doing. Tribulation. 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 Why does the pastor keep talking about, why does he keep repeating that? Because you don't get it. You glory in trials. In difficulties. You glory when you lost your job. You glory when you don't have no money. You glory when you don't have the car. You glory when this trial and that trial and all of it came on you one time and you're sitting there going, girl, I didn't know what to do. I was so overwhelmed, I couldn't even pray. You didn't glory. <laughs> devil got the glory that moment. You didn't pray, the devil got the glory. You remember when the job and the devil came and he said, Job, I'm going to make him curse in your face? You remember that? What did he mean? Oh, Job was going to get delivered. God, why did you do so and so? Is that what it's going to be? Uh -uh. Curse you to your face means in the Hebrew not to pray or bow the knee to worship God. So when you get overwhelmed with your trials because you don't, you have lost faith in the Word of God because you let the devil sidetrack you with TV and Black Panther and all that other stuff. Well, Y'all don't want to go there yet. We're going to go there tomorrow. Help some of you young people out. You've been there. I'm watching Black. Oh, that was so inspiring. Oh, spiritualism is inspiring, huh? Coming to the dead is inspiring, right? Oh, y'all forgot it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. oh I'm hoping, I forgot. I forgot. I'm supposed to be in the Bible so well I don't see these other things. <laughs> supposed to be oblivious to this, right? Our young people caught up with it. Our churches, some of them went to go see it. We're watching a man sitting there talking to the dead. And Ecclesiastes 9 5, talking in faith. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know that nothing. And everybody goes, ooh, this is so good. Oh, little swords! So like, what? What? I was in a meeting. I, I was invited to go to a meeting, and my at a commencement graduation of a nephew of mine that's out in the world. And the speaker got up to talk about how Black Panther was such an expiring movie to him. He watched it seven times, and he's gonna watch it again because it was so inspiring as Black people were told to go back to their roots. And find their witch doctors and their and, and their and their and their black magic and, and call on the animal spirits. But you know, but Pastor C now, Pastor Barry, you just being fanatical. You say like, you can't, you just can't be like that. Yes, the movie, Pastor Barry, really, really, talking to the dead, just the movie, right? Well, tell me about the people going to the graveyards now doing this now, Mom. I don't know what I'm gonna do next, Mom. Ah. Living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Why haven't you told the people in the community? Why haven't you been working to save the souls and bring the truth and bring them out of darkness into a marvelous life? It's a superhero. It's a fictitious movie. Go out there and, jump and let a car chase you. And you flip upside down and tell me where you're going to be. <laughs> you're going to be in the hospital in the grave somewhere. Tell me if you're going to tell me if you run and your, and your body suit going to turn into claws and carry on. And you're going to scratch your mouth. There's a big tension moving. You're being entertained with spiritualism. What is wrong with us? We have lost our bearings of who we are. And our children, have we come up now and we're like ancient Israel? We got a generation that don't know God, nor the power of God, nor the movings of God's Spirit. We better wake up. And everybody's looking for a superhero. Because everybody's looking for miracles. I was working with Satan is on the way. Don't you worry. The Bible says in Revelation 16, 13, and 14, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out the mouth of the dragon, and out the mouth of the beast, and out the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth, into the whole world, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Brothers and sisters, you're being gathered. If you're being gathered with Jesus, or you're being gathered by spiritual demons that are preparing you to go against Christ in the second coming. And if you don't get 
revived and reformed now, it's going to be too late pretty soon. Yes, 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 yes. It's time now to make up your mind that, Lord, I don't care what's going to happen. When this evangelist meeting comes, I'm going to get revived. And I'm going to follow your word. I'm going to follow the Bible. I'm going to follow the spirit of prophecy. I'm going to stand my ground. I'm going to get rooted and grounded in the faith. And if i got to contend, so be it. Let me not fight with, 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 with the useless weapons. Let me not fight with man-made armor. But let me fight with the armor of the spirit of the living God. Yes, yes, yes. Better get ready. You gotta fight. Amen. You don't believe you gotta fight yet. You'll see when you'll see when the Protestants and the number of churches start coming and you question me about your Sabbath. Hmm. Don't find out where you are. For hmm. so what Paul says, we glory in what? Tribulation. Tell me something. You glory in tribulation? Because your faith of Jesus is based on patience. Hmm. Meaning, will you still believe and have faith in Jesus and exercise all that it is, keep going and keep fellowshipping, keep studying the word of God in the midst of your trial? Because if you if you like a chocolate soldier, you melt under pressure. Then you don't have faith of Jesus. You get to the point that trials come and you can't even formulate your lips to pray. You don't have faith in Jesus. If you think the pastor can answer all your questions, you won't take time to search the scriptures for yourself. You don't have faith. Some of us think the pastor got to do everything. We're paying him all to. Paying him? Really? I thought you were paying God. And I thought that because he was a man of God, you're supposed to pay God because God, through you, is supposed to support him and take him his back. If he sold you spiritual things, is it a strange thing that you give of your temporal? You're not paying him. You're giving back what God gave you. Amen. Now, where people get? I don't know where we get off of this at. We not in the, this ain't the world. This this ain't corp. This ain't this ain't G. This ain't General Motors. <laughs> you know, stockholders here. I don't, I don't, I, I'm not gonna go too far with that because I, I, there is a place where we where, where we messing up over there too. That's not my subject this morning. This evening. Let's go back now. So wait a minute. Jesus said, I can't see the body of the gold trying to buy it. But you can't buy it unless you're thirsty. That's what Isaiah told us. Hold but thirst, but you got a hold and thirst after what? Righteousness. Who's righteousness? Christ righteousness. First Corinthians 1 30 says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Jesus is our what? Wisdom. Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our sanctification. Jesus is our redemption. Is that right? So therefore, you must buy of Christ and his righteousness. But in order to buy, you must feel your need. You must recognize you have a need that you are thirsty for righteousness. You're hungry for it. You're thirsty for it. You've got to have it. It's life and death with you. When you get that way, God will give you drink. He will not deny you. Look a little closer with me. So we're going to buy. He says, the country buy me gold. Now how do you buy the gold? By faith. Look what the Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 1 7. 1 Peter 1 7. Come on. 1 Peter 1 7. Are you there? 1 Peter 1 7. Let me ask you. Okay. Are you there? <coughs> in 1 Peter 1 7, the Bible says, that the trial of your faith, the trial of your what? Now, why, you have, why does he talk about the trial of your faith? Because what do we read over in Romans chapter 5? That, that you're going to have what? Tribulation. And tribulation, with tribulation, you're going to have, have patience. And with patience and tribulation combined, it's going to give you what? Experience. That experience is going to be faith of Jesus. If that's if you endure the trial and you still maintain your faith faith in Jesus and you don't get shaken out of Christ. 
So you can be in the church and be shaken out. You don't know. You can be in the church, you can come every Sabbath and still be shaken out. Because spiritually, you're not in Christ. You're not spending time with God. Especially if you always argue every Sabbath. You and your wife before you get in the house, get in the church. Now, I'm not going to have it this Sabbath. You're going to act right. Don't you tell me how to act. Huh? Now, we all get all the way to the door. Now, oh, you go double brother so-and-so. Now, act right. <laughs> hey, brother so how you doing? See ya. Yes, I'm a great pretender. Okay. Look what the Bible goes on and says now. Looking at this issue. So now Peter says that you buy the is this here that you buy gold tried in the what? Fire. But that represents your what? It says that the trial of your what? Your faith, your belief, your belief in the word of God, which is the very substance, will be tried by fire, by difficulty, by trial. And yet at the same time, your trial and your faith in the word of God being more precious than gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the what? Praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Peter 4, 12. And so you again, it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing had happened unto you, but rejoice in so much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Do you rejoice? Where's your hymn? What's your favorite hymn under pressure? What? You don't have a favorite hymn under pressure? You must not have any pressure yet. You don't have a favorite hymn when you're unemployed? You don't sing Bring in the Sheep? You're just going to be like, oh, somebody, let me tell you something. When you, when you lose your job, that's the best thing to be in. Because you just, you, you just rub your hands, you say, thank you, Jesus. No more pressure from the man. I'm going out here and work for Jesus. Now, when the devil sees that you're going to work for Jesus, you're going to get a job quicker than the people out there unemployed. <laughs> You don't believe me. God, God, God don't believe me. You, you don't, if all of you quit your job tomorrow, oh, you've been looking for a job. Now, you've been looking for a job all this month, or for the last three months. You can't find anything. The moment, the moment you say, Pastor, I'm going to go get Bible studies. While the fact is me coming up, I'm going to go get Bible studies. Guess what's going to happen? The people that you were nine, you were number 999 on the, on the list. And suddenly your name comes up and they call you. This is so such a corporation. We want to know what you're interested in coming down for interview. And you're like, oh, what now? Yeah, you were way down there, but we looked around there. We just found out you were probably more qualified than some of our other people. Why don't you come on in for an interview? We offer this and you'll get a certain type of benefit package, and if you're hired, you can start to start on Monday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just saying what happened. You don't believe it. You really don't, don't believe it. Try it. Anybody here on the floor? Anybody here on the floor right now? Your job, you got laid off. Anybody like that? You don't raise your hand for embarrassment, it's okay too. <laughs> But I'm gonna tell you something. If you are, just go, go just start, just say it. I'm gonna go out and take, I'm gonna go get some literature, I'm gonna pass it out. Then I'm gonna go house I'm gonna look for a Bible study. I'm gonna look for one person for a Bible study. And I guarantee you, the devil will make sure you get a job. Because at that time, you're gonna have so much joy working for Jesus, so you don't want to go back to your job. You the only thing you're hoping now is the Lord, how can I do this and keep my family going? That's what you want to figure out next. But you got to remember, if God brought joy to you while working for him, that means he's already got a way for you to work and sustain your family while you work for him. Y'all don't believe me, see? And I, I know from experience from being a call porter. But I'm going to come to that. I'm coming to that in the last few minutes. I'm watching my, watching my clock here. And i got to hurry and get y'all out of here now. But I want to just give you this. Now, the Bible says, Oh, try to what? Fire, which you have on white rain. What is white rain, right quick? Go read Revelation 19, 8. When Isaiah said, Woe is me, I'm undone, for I'm a man of the lips, and I dwell with his people on the lips. And then he said, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he take him off the altar. And he put it upon my lips, and put it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this is touched thy lips, thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sins purged. This is a symbol of him receiving righteousness and being cleansed from his life of sin, his old life. And now he's having, he's taken, the old garment has been removed, not covered up. 
like in some of our pictures of Sabbath lessons. It's been removed, and Christ now will cover him with his righteousness. Are you with me now? Amen. Christ does not cover up your old righteousness mm -hmm. or your old that he removes it. But Laodicea is naked, so Christ has to cover you. But if you were a person that had filthy rags, he removes all the filthy rags. Then he covers you with his righteousness. Mm -hmm. All right, this is very important. Now watch carefully. So Revelation 19.8 said what? Revelation 19.8. The Bible says here, And to her was granted she should be, that she should be arrayed in what? Fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is what? Righteousness of the saints. What's the righteousness of the saints? Fine linen. That fine linen is what? Righteousness. So when Jesus said, I'm not buy me gold, try to fire, that you might have faith, and that you might have a white ring. What's white ring? Righteousness. So what is Jesus telling the Laodicea? What's the message of Laodicea? Righteousness by faith. That's the message to get you out of your lukewarm condition. Are you with me now? Now, why is that important? Because Isaiah was a partaker of righteousness by faith. And when he, when he, got, his, when he got cleansed, where did Isaiah do? Tell me where he went. What was the first thing? He went to church and told, and just sat there, right? The Bible said, he heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I sin? Who will go for us? Then said I, Hear my sin be. Isaiah went to work for Jesus right away. Amen. God called some of you a long time ago. You said amen then too. And you still didn't go to work. But you doubted that God would sustain you and your family. When he called some of you to sell books years ago, you didn't go. But you said, I don't I can't sell no book. God didn't call you to sell a book. He called you to be a witness. And know how to use the books as a tool to get in the home and witness with the book. But you thought it was selling. So you said, I'm not going to do that. Or some of you went out and you had such a bad experience in the beginning. Till you got out there and said, I'm not going out there, but I never embarrassed me like that. And God gave you that experience to show you your need to depend totally on Him and not rely in your own strength under the pressure that you were dealing with. Now, why am I saying that? Because I'm going to tell you like this. Michael stands up. He's dealing with the close of human probation. We're on the verge of the close of human probation, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And God is calling us to do a last work in these last days. Mm -hmm. Now, I gave you theory all this time. Now, for the last few moments, I'm going to give you some, give you some experiences. And I'm going to just say it like this to you. And I'm going to mean it like this. And I'm not bragging. But I give God the glory for it. I don't have the power. Let me go on record with that. I don't have the power. The Holy Ghost has the power. Amen. If we submit ourselves to Christ and yield to the leading of the Holy Ghost, He will tell us where to go. He will show us who we need to see. And we are dependent on Him. I mean, one time I gave one of these experiences, some crackpot got on the, uh, I call it crackpot. Adventist, got on there, oh, Brother Barry's talking about he's casting out demons and all this other stuff. Where? Like, 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 it's like, like I'm just in here bragging about myself. And I realized that, that person had not been a Paul Porter, had not been really in deep soul winning, nor did he recognize demon possession when he saw it. And most of us don't like to talk about stuff like this because we think that is beyond. That's, that's another dimension. No, it's not. It is part of the everlasting gospel. And it's connected to the power of God unto salvation. Amen. But if you don't have a living connection, then you will not talk about these things, Amen. nor will you have an experience with them. Yes. Now, I'm just being straight with your body. Now, the reason why I said it is because when I was caught ordering, every morning you got to have a connection. You need to get up in the morning about 4 o'clock <coughs> at the latest. Sometimes I'm up at 3, but most time at 4 and at that time, you need to spend time in prayer and Bible study. 
You need to make sure when you pray, you talk about your family, you pray about your family, you intercede for other people, then you start praying for your own soul. Because you're a priest. So you're the priest of your home. And if you're single, you're the priest of your home. And if you're married, the husband's going to be the priest. If he's too lazy, then the wife got to get up and pray. Hmm. I hate to say it that way, but it's true. Some women got more faith than men in the church nowadays. Unfortunately. But that's nevertheless, nevertheless. So when you get up in the morning, you got to have a living connection. So that you can pray for the Holy Spirit to tell you where you need to work. And there are times you go out in the field, the Holy Ghost, you're headed one place, the Holy Ghost say, go over, go over and breathe. Well, Lord, I went over there yesterday, go over there again. Somebody gets you, go to the third house on the left. I remember one day going out in the field with my friend. While we were out in the field this particular day, we normally go out every day, and I told my friend, I said, uh, his name was Paige, I said, Paige, I said, the Lord is telling me we need to go to the hospital. And Paige looked at me and said, Barry, are you serious? He said, man, we, 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 we got we to gotta work all, we got to work this field today. I said, Paige, the Lord is telling me we need to go to the hospital. And he said, okay, what hospital? I said, I don't know. He said, now you said the Lord is telling you to go to the hospital, and you don't know where we need to go? I said, hold on a minute. I went, here, I went under a tree. I said, Lord, you said go to the hospital. What hospital do you want me to go to? The Holy Spirit said, Harbor. So I went back to my buddy, and I said, Paige, the Lord is telling me we need to go to Harbor Hospital. So he said, okay. So they got, we got in the car, and we started driving. Then he came to me and said, Barry. I said, yeah. He said, um, who are we going to see at Harbor Hospital? I said, I don't know. He said, you got to be driving to Harbor Hospital. You don't know who you're going to see? I said, no. I said, hold on a minute. I knelt over the back of the peak, laid my head down on the knee towards the window. I said, Lord, what am I going to see? And when I got out, when I got to the hospital, the Holy Spirit said to me, a young lady. So I told Paige, I said, I'm here to see a young lady. He said, what? <laughs> We're here to see a young lady. So I woke up and I said, and he said, well, what's her name? I said, I don't know. He said, I said, well, hold on a minute. And I went back and walked a little way by the car and I prayed again. So what am I here to see? So the Holy Spirit said, Johnson. I said, we're going to see the lady in Johnson. So Paige, my partner looked at me like I lost my mind. I'm going to say, just like you're looking at me now. <laughs> And I told him, I said, the Lord's telling me we got to go to the hospital. And we got to go see this young lady named Johnson. So we get to the hospital. I'm out of the car. He asked me the name. I told him the name. I walk in the door. And while we're doing all this, I'm at, I go up to the counter, information desk. I said, how you doing, ma'am? She said, yes, may I help you? I said, yes. My name is uh, Evangelist Maurice Berry. And I'm here to see a young lady uh, named Johnson. And he looked at me and said, <laughs> said, Mr. Berry, there's a lot of Johnson in the hospital. Do you know the first name? I said, I don't know. He said, you know what floor she on? I said, no. He said, well, can you hold on? I said, hold on a minute. So I went over to the corner. I said, hey, come on. Came over to the corner. I said, we need to pray again. I said, Lord, who is it I'm here to see? And what floor are they on? And the Holy Spirit said, third floor. So I go back to the counter. And I said, how you doing, man? I'm here to see a lady. A young lady, her name is Johnson, and she's on the third floor. And she showed me the sinner spirit. She said, do you know her first name? He said, there's a lot of Johnsons on the third floor. <laughs> and I said, I really don't know. Now, while I'm saying this, I see a lady running, running through the hospital corridors. She's in a hurry. She kind of like moved me and Paige out of the way. And she got her, got her pass and went on the elevator. I said, wow, that lady's in a hurry. Meanwhile, we're still downstairs and we're trying to work with this thing here. And um, the lady said, I said, Madam, I'm telling you, I have to see a young lady on the third floor. Now, my partner is totally skeptical. Just like you are. But one thing is certain. I know what God told me. And I said, we got to go on the third floor. The lady said, well, I can't give you a pass because you don't have the name, but... Go back to those back service elevators back there and just take one of them up to the third floor. 
and look around. Maybe you might find what you're looking for. Just, just go back there. Talking about, we can go back on the back service elevators. We got them on the third floor. When we got to the third floor, the Holy Spirit told me to wait right there near the elevator. Get out of the elevator and just wait right there in the corner. So my partner looked at me and nudged me and said, Hey, 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 Barry, where are we going? I said, The Lord said, Wait right here. He said, What? I said, The Lord said, Wait right here. I said, Who are we going to see? It's coming around the corner. So some doctors came around the corner. He said, That one? I said, No. So more families came around the corner. That one? I said, No. And I, and I was praying. I said, Lord, you got to show me who they are. He said, that them? No. Another family came out of the corner. Is that them? No. He said, Barry, who are we here to see? I said, the Lord going to show us in a few moments. Just hold on. Just pray with me. While we're sitting there, suddenly a lady walks around the corner real slow. Tears are in our eyes. And the Holy Spirit said, that's her. I walked up to the woman and I said, pardon me, ma'am. My name is Evangelist Maurice Barry. And God has sent me here for you. She said, what? She said, I said, God has sent me here for you. Then the woman said, come with me, come with me, come with me. And she took me around the corner. And we walked around the corner and we went to a little room. And in the room was a 10-year-old girl. She was dying of sickle cell anemia. And I had the children Bible stories in my head. And her name was, and I said, what's her name? Her name is Kelly. And I said to her, how you doing, Kelly? So how you doing? I said, I'm here to pray with you and talk to you about Jesus. So, oh, I love Jesus. I really love Jesus. My mommy taught me all about Jesus. She said, you going to pray for me? I said, yes, Kelly, we're going to pray. But before we do, Kelly, I want to tell you a story. And I began that, and I read to her about Christ's second coming. I told her about how God will raise the children from the dead. I began to tell her how wonderful heaven's going to be. And that little girl sat there and cried, tears coming out of her cheek, talking very slow and shaky voice. I just said, can I have this book? No, no, we'll sell it. I said, you can have it. And she took the book and said, oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I love you, Jesus. She was crying. And I was crying too by that moment. And I said, Kelly, we're going to pray. And I prayed with her that God would save her. That one day, she'll be made. After I prayed, the lady looked at me and said, she said, for 30 days, I have been praying that God would send a minister to the hospital to pray for my needs. She said, every day I came and no one came. She said, I was here earlier today and I came to the room because I had this impression that someone would come. And she said, I, 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 I waited and waited and nobody came and I left and I was driving home. And said, while I was on my way home, she said, a voice spoke to me in the car and said, turn your car around. There's someone at the hospital to pray for your niece. So I turned my car around as fast as I could. I drove up into the parking lot. I jumped out the car. I ran into the information desk. I quickly got a pass, jumped on the elevator, and came to the third floor. And when I came to the room where my, niece, my niece was, there was nobody there. And she said, it, it was just my imagination. And I walked away in tears. Then you stopped me and told me that God has sent you here to pray for me. And she said, and I took you to the room and I said, excuse me. I said, before you went to what room is this? My partner was standing right there. She said, this is room 303. I said, what is your niece's last name? She said, my niece's name is Kelly Johnson. And I sat there and I said, Lord, then she said, and you know, I want to say something. She said, I used to be a Seventh-day Adventist. She said, I walked away from the faith, and I didn't believe God would even hear my prayer anymore. And I said, madam, that's what we are. We, I am a Seventh-day Adventist. She said, oh my God. She said, she said, now I know that God hears and answers prayer. I'm not telling you something out of a book now. I'm telling you what happens when you submit your life to Christ and you have a living connection. I am telling you what the Spirit of God will do for every one of you if you would connect yourself with God and put away sin and say to yourself, Lord, help me walk in obedience and live a sanctified life. Amen. That the power of God may rest upon me.
That's what happened. Amen. Final story I'm going to tell you and close you out. One day, you know, I asked you about do you have faith on the trial? When I left my job at General Motors, I was going through a lot of trials because back in those days as a call porter, the conference would sometimes hold up your check. Especially if we didn't pay no commission back in those days. They would hold up the check if they didn't get the money from the customers. So Lynch Vallis would go around, one minute he got money, next minute he broke his, he broke it in everybody in the church. A lot of church members wouldn't, wouldn't become Lynch Vallis because every time they saw us on Sabbath, we had the same old suits on all time. And our shoes were leaked over from walking. We couldn't afford somehow even buy stockings for our wives. I'll tell you how it was. See, man was the only outward appearance. But God puts it to harm. We was going through it in those days. And I was 19 years old. I'm 20. At that time, yeah, 19 years old. And now I'm talking, I'm walking around in church. And other 19 year olds, I opened college. They all got that prestige and everything else and talking all that hot and hot. And I'm sitting around there with a case in my hand and a book in my hand and walking around with a two tone suit. Pants don't match the jacket. And my shoes linked over. Because I can't afford to buy shoes. Because I'm walking every day. And while I'm walking every day, it gets so bad, can I take a piece of, and, 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 and I'm telling you like it is. Now you want to know the truth. You know, some people are like talking about, it's too embarrassing. Why would you say something? I'm telling you like it is. But some of you don't know what trials yet. Go through yet. Some of you think you know. You don't know what trials is yet. You kind of hold on to God. Would you kind of get a, your, your shoes so far out at the bottom to all you can, only thing you can do is get you a piece of cardboard and cut out a footprint and put it inside your shoe. And when you come down to kneel in front, you make sure you kneel in such a way so that people can't see the back of your shirt. That's how bad it gets. I'm just saying like it is. Now I'm sitting there and I'm praying. I'm praying and some older women will pray every morning with me and say, young man, don't you get discouraged. You just stay out there for Jesus. You God will take care of you. Don't you worry. This is nothing but a test. God speaking to the young, to the old people and trying to keep you encouraged. A lot of young people said, man, that's probably true. He left his job at General Motors, he must be crazy. I left my job because I had a dream. I had the same dream three nights in a row. And it was a call to the ministry and evangelism. I didn't leave my job because I just I wanted to be out there in the field. I left my job because God called me. God will call you. While I'm sitting there doing all that one day, I'm out there knocking on doors, and I said, the conference had held up my check. The, crack, the gas man comes knocking on the door. Mr. Berry. Pay your bill today? I said, no, this your bill's a thousand dollars. I said, it can't be a thousand dollars. Mr. Perry, this is Michigan Solid Gas Company. We do not lie. I said, something's wrong with that. My bill's not a thousand dollars. Mr. Perry, if you can't pay today, we're gonna take and meet out the house. So they come in at below zero weather, five below zero weather, and go downstairs in my basement and take my meter out the house, take my whole gas, take it upstairs, and they say, you and put a lock on the put a lock on the pipe. And say, you can pay this, we're coming in. Come again. We're bringing back. What else happened? Landlord come. Are you gonna pay your rent this month? I said, my father's gonna send the money. Well, when are you gonna send it? I said, it's supposed to come in this few weeks out. Just hold on. My father was my heavenly father. But my real father was dead. Then the electric bill come. Bill overdue. Need to be paid. Where's my money? Conference holding up my money. Because of accounts in the field that I can't, that they, they can't collect from the office, so they collect it from the call board. Now, what am I to do? I said, Lord, so my public director comes to my house and says, Barry, we need you in the field. You need to come out of the field with us one more time. I said, I'm not going with you. Well, every time I sell the book, y'all gonna take it and send it to the conference, and y'all not taking no money. I gotta pay my bills. I said, y'all, I said, you pay your bills. I said, I said, I said, other Bob and them paying their bills. I, I said, why can't I pay my bills? I said, y'all hold up my money and then tell me it's my fault that the people not paying for the book. I said, I'm not going with you today. No, you go ahead. And I got on my knees and I read that promise. Because it was cold that day. It was so cold that day. I had to go to, I read a promise that he deserved the wind shall not sow. He deserved the rain shall not reap. And I weather man said, be urging all residents to stay indoors. I said, I got to go in that field anyway. I got I got God, you got to bless me. Today, you got to bless me. Today, I started at 9 o'clock, 7.30 that evening. 
Nothing. Went to every house. Nobody let me in. Nobody let me in. I was knocking the doors and I was knocking. I was so cold. I was like, oh, my name is Pastor. My name is Pastor. I'm, I'm so cold. I can't hardly open my mouth. And while I'm out there knocking on doors, I'm praying. So, Lord, you got to bless me today. I've got to have the money. You've got to take care of me today. I've got to pay my bills. I said, I'm not trusting in man now, Lord. You said, call upon me and I will answer you. You've got to answer me today. And I went out there, worked all day, nothing. Sat in my car, it was dark now. People don't usually let you in after sunset. The Holy Spirit said, get out of the car and go right there. Now, I had been working up the street. I had parked my car down the street. The Holy Spirit, go right there. I went to the house, they said, I can't let nobody set. I said, how you know, man, my name is Maurice Barry. I'm from the family of the kids service. My call is on the special importance. Man, speak to me. He said, I can't let nobody in. I said, nobody. I said, nobody. I said, Madam Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. He said, well, since Jesus said it, come on in. <laughs> and she let me in the house. I was in shock. <laughs> so come on in. And he came in. She said, I said, she said, my daughter got a contagious disease. I said, Madam, I will not catch your daughter. For the first cause, it shall not come. Amen. And then I showed her the Bible reading for the home. I came to the book, and the lady loved the book so much. said, my pastor probably got this book. He said, if he don't, I got something on him. Now I'm going to be just as smart as he is. <laughs> That's what she said. And she bought that book right there on the spot. $39. Never forget. But I need more than $39. And I walked to that house and said, Lord, now what to do? Holy Spirit said, go to the last house over there. Skip all the other houses in the snow and walk to the last house on the left. And I'm walking. And I'm walking. I finally get down to the far end of the block. Last house on the left. I knock on the door. A lady said, come on in. I said, what? <laughs> she said, come on in. I said, ma'am, you didn't hear what I said. She said, come on in. I walked through the door. She said, I've been waiting on you. I started looking around like this. You started to say, you see what? I was starting to it up. So I've been waiting on you. She said, every morning I meet with God at 3 o'clock. She said, I prayed that God would give me wisdom. God told me wisdom was coming to my house at 7.30 by a man in a black coat with a black bag. She said, you are a man, you got a black coat, and you got a black bag. You must be him. He said, I am to buy everything in your bag. I said, well, madam, you don't even know what I have. She said, the check is on the table. You can show me that. But I canceled on the whole Bible reference library, children Bible stories and everything. She bought everything. At that time, the check was $563.63. She paid for it all. And when I came out, now that means the sales were at over, over, at that point it was like, oh, it was like $50 million. But that lady, God prepared that woman for me at that house. When I got, when she gave me that, when she, when she paid for those books, and I went back home, I had enough money to go to the gas company. I didn't send that to the conference. <laughs> look at me like I lost my mind. I had to pay my bills. Y'all look at me, I had to pay my bills. I took my time out, I paid my bills. I went to that, I went and paid my bills at the gas company. The gas company lady said to me, Mr. Barry, Mission Consolidated Gas Company never makes a mistake. Oh, hold on. Oh, Mr. Barry, there's been a mistake. Your bill is only $300. If you pay that today, we can get your gas back on. I said, thank you very much, and I paid it. Then I went to my landlord. My, my rent there was $125. I went and paid the rent, and it was, it was two months behind, but I paid the rent. I paid the $125, and I paid it that time. You can't believe that was like that in those days. But that's what it was, right there in Detroit. And as a result, I paid all my bills, plus I paid the gas, electric bill later, and all the rest. And then when the conference sent me my check, I signed it back. What I, what I spent out of my sale, and I turned it back and reendorsed it back to the death. That's the money for the book sale. What am I telling you? I'm talking about the power of God. 
I'm talking about God taking care of you in your extremities. And if God can do that for me then, then I'm not worried about the market. I'm not worried about when you can't buy or sell. Because I've learned that when I could not buy or sell, my God took care of me then, and he will take care of me now. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's Alpha, he's Omega, he's beginning, he's the end, he's the first, he's the last, he's the one of the of lovely, he's the lily of the valley, the bright morning star, the parish of 10,000. He is Jesus, and Jesus will take care of you. Don't ever forget. I tell you that to give you encouragement. Tomorrow, we talk about the history of Adventism. And in the afternoon, in the afternoon we will deal, we're going to deal with an issue on spiritualism and Hollywood. Yes. Those of you who are going to be back. So God bless you. God keep you. May you have faith. May you, when your faith is tried, may you hold on to the promises of God. Amen. No, He will take care of yes. you. Yes. Amen. 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 Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the study of your word. Continue to be with thy people. Help us get home safely and keep us in your care. And may each be inspired to do evangelism and to do the work that they're called to do and to trust you have revival and reformation and prepare their soul for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.